the scripture lesson today comes from the Sermon on the Mount, and we've been studying that over the course of the last few weeks. Jesus is sitting among his disciples and others that have come to hear him preach his word. And today I'm reading out of Matthew chapter 5, 33 through 48. Again, you have heard it was said to those who lived long ago, don't make a false, solemn pledge, but you should follow through on what you have pledged to the Lord. But I say to you that you must not pledge at all. You must not pledge by heaven because it's God's throne. You must not pledge by the earth because it's God's footstool. You must not pledge by Jerusalem because it's the city of the great king. And you must not pledge by your head because you can't turn one hair white or black. Let your yes mean yes and your no mean no. Anything more than this comes from the evil one. You have heard it that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you that you must not oppose those who want to hurt you. If people slap you on your right cheek, you must turn the left cheek to them as well. When they wish to haul you to court and take your shirt, let them have your coat too. When they force you to go one mile, go with them too. Give to those who ask, and don't refuse those who wish to borrow from you. You have heard it said, you must love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who harass you, so that you will be acting as children of your your father who is in heaven. He makes the sun rise on both the evil and the good and sends rain on both the righteous and the unrighteous. If you love only those who love you, what reward do you have? Don't even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet only your brothers and sisters, what more are you doing? Don't even the Gentiles do the same? Therefore, just as your heavenly Father is complete in showing love to everyone, so also you must be complete. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Thank you. It has been a while since I've been up here, and I am excited to be up here today. For those of you who are new with us, on first Sundays we are making an effort to teach our children what it is to be in worship, um, but we realize they, they wiggle, so do you. <laughs> we can see it. <laughs> <laughs> and um, so we have trying something new um, for a couple months now, and they are sitting over here coloring pictures that go right along with the message that they're hearing in hopes that some of it will seep in. And so the teenagers have volunteered to help them today. So that's what's happening over here if you were wondering. And kids, hey, hey, kids, I hope you're still listening. Okay, there might be a test at the end. I'm just kidding. There's no test. Okay. All right. Uh, We are in the middle of a sermon series, as Trisha told you, on the Sermon on the Mount. And we have been um, hearing what Jesus taught to his disciples so long ago and wondering, how does this apply to our lives? So a few weeks ago, we did the Beatitudes, and we learned that each one of us is blessed in some way. We did the salt and the light, and we learned that we as Christians are called to be light in the darkness Even in that dark world, we are called to be the ones out there. Last week, Drew taught us not to kill people. Did you do a good job? If you didn't, we're mandatory reporters, so we'll have to tell on you. No, I'm just kidding. I know you did, but it's also about controlling your anger, which can be very difficult, not lusting after somebody or something, and then treating your relationships with respect and trying before you just give up on one. If you missed these sermons and this has intrigued you and you want to know more about it, don't forget we have CDs in the back. It's a ministry of our church. We want to be able to send them home with you. They're also on YouTube if you want to know how to get 
onto YouTube, I'm not the person to ask. <laughs> I think Drew knows. <laughs> um, but so that's where we have been in today's passage is completing what we started last week, where there are six episodes of things that Jesus says, I say, you've heard it said, but I say to you, and today we are going to do oaths. So you have heard it said, don't make a false solemn pledge, but you should follow through on what, on what you pledged to the Lord that you would do. But I say to you, you must not pledge at all. Well, that's kind of a complicated passage. And in Bible times, as I like to say, when people made oaths between each other, there were two parties involved, much like today, and they always evoked God. And they said, we promise to do X and Y, and I say so in God's name. And so um, it's like our court system. If you've ever been in the court system or watched Law and Order, you have seen them say, do you promise to tell the whole truth, um, nothing but the truth, so help you God? And they say, I do. The whole system is based on this promise to tell the truth. And if we don't have faith in that promise, there is distrust and there is chaos in our court system. Jesus says, that's all well and good, but I don't think that's what we should do. And I don't know that we should make promises at all. And if you're like me, you thought, "Uh uh-oh, I make promises every day. I promise that I will do the dishes. I promise that I will um, read Madeline six bedtime stories. He gets more and more every day. I promise to take out the trash. (coughs) John, did you take out the trash? I'm just kidding. I promise to finish that project at work. We make these promises, and Jesus says, I don't know that you should be doing that. And The class that I taught last week on this said, well, how are we supposed to do that? And so I thought of a story that we all know. This is one of Aesop's fable, and it's the boy who cries wolf. Once there was a boy who was taking care of the sheep in his village. And he was bored one day, and just to see what happened, he yelled, wolf! And all of the villagers dropped their things, and they come running to rescue the sheep. They needed these sheep for survival. And the boy says, I tricked you! I got you, April Fools. And they went back to what they were doing. And a little while later, he thought, well, that worked. Let's see if we can do it again. And he yells, wolf, wolf. And they drop their things, and he comes running. And this time, he's laughing even harder because he got them again. And how would that make you feel? Angry, right? You would not trust him anymore. He broke his promise. And so they left mad. A week or so later, what happens? You know what happens. A wolf comes. And the boy says, wolf, there's actually a wolf. And the people are like, no, we know you're not. They didn't even move. And the wolf devoured those sheep. And the people lost what they needed. And that boy had lied and broken his promise to only bring them in when they needed to. I think this is kind of where Jesus is going with us today. We need to be intentional in the words that we use and the promises that we make. If you promise to do something, you should absolutely absolutely do it, is what Jesus is saying. If I promise to clean my room, kids, I should clean my room. If I'm a teenager and I promise to not to come home by curfew, I should come home by curfew. If I'm a grown-up and I promise to give my kid some ice cream when they get all A's, I should absolutely do that. This is what Jesus is saying. But what happens in our own lives, right? We get busy. We don't necessarily mean not to keep our promises, but we do forget. And then distrust comes in. Jesus is saying, maybe it would be better if you never made a promise at all. And instead, follow through on what you should be doing. This is what Jesus is saying. That's a relatively easy passage. Let's move on to what the next thing that Jesus says. He says, You have heard it said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, you must not oppose those who want to hurt you. He goes on and he says, If people slap you on your right cheek, you should turn the other cheek to them. 
When they take you to court and take your shirt, you should give them your coat, too. When they force you to go one mile, go with them, too. With the cheek slapping, we're exploring whether or not this should be taken literally. Let's think about it. Back in the day, when they say, I'm going to slap you on your right cheek, it's a backhanded slap like this. You can practice it on your neighbor. I'm joking. Please don't practice it on your neighbor. <laughs> So they would slap them like this, and if you see, that's how a lot of force is going to build up behind that. So you've had your cheek slapped, and Jesus says, instead of punching them, which is what we want to do, turn your other cheek and let them slap the other one. If, when they were taken to court back in the day, it says if they take your shirt or your chiton, this is what it looks like, it's their main garment, Give them your coat, too. This is what their coats look like. That would leave somebody standing naked in court. Is that what Jesus really meant? I, I don't necessarily think so. I think there's another message behind it. Because if we take these literally, I don't know that we're learning much of a lesson at all except to perpetuate violence and to be naked in court. Please don't do that. Shonda, are you here? Do you want people standing naked in your court? I don't think she's here today. I don't think that's the point of what Jesus is saying. What Jesus is saying is, we are Christians, and so as Christians we should be steady enough in our love of God, we should be secure enough in our acceptance of the love of God that our earthly rights don't matter as much. That we should not be so worried about what we think and be more worried about what God thinks. This is a message that Jesus taught all the time. It's throughout the Gospels. We know this, and the Apostle Paul carried it into the first century. But to hear in 2017, it's a very foreign concept. We live in a land of it's all about me all the time. Let's look at Burger King. Burger King, have it your way, right? What other slogans do you know? From the time that we're small, we're thinking, we're teaching kids. You can do whatever you want to do. You can be whoever you want to be. It's all about you. And there's nothing wrong with that to a point. But what Jesus is saying is there's more than that to this. It is more important that we're furthering the kingdom of God than getting it all our way. This is uncomfortable. This is very uncomfortable. And it's a little unsettling. But don't get caught up into the words. Think more about the intentions. As Christians, it's our job to put God's kingdom first and our needs and rights and human desires second. That's what Jesus is saying. One of this, this passage people get frustrated with because there is a lot of racism, sexism, hard things in the world. And they say, okay, if we're not supposed to retaliate, how will this ever get better? And I think that the next passage will teach us a little bit more about that. Jesus says, you have heard it said, you must love your neighbor and hate your enemy. I can do that. Can you do that? I'm good at that. But Jesus says, but I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who harass you so that you will be acting as children of your Father who is in heaven. He completes this part that says, Therefore, just as your heavenly Father is complete in showing love to everyone, so you must also be complete. For weeks now, we have been letting Jesus change our hearts and our minds, and we have said, All right, I'll stop killing people. That one's easy. I'll that was a joke. You can laugh. <laughs> I'll stop being anger. I'll keep it in check. I promise that I won't lust. I'll work on my relationships. I'll even work at being more truthful, which is hard. I can even turn the other cheek and not be violent. I can do that. But this is taking it too far. I have to love my enemies, that person, that thing, that movement is hurting me. Does Jesus mean this literally? Is it possible for us to do this? Because it seems impossible. But here's the good news for us today. God doesn't ask us to do something that is impossible. God empowers us and gives us the ability to do things that seem impossible. 
The love of God and neighbor is the fundamental command on which all else depends. And that makes this command specific and concrete. And if Jesus commands us to do it, we have the ability to do it. I have two stories today. One is about the Presbyterian Church. The Presbyterian Church here in the United States is going through a heated battle, much similar to the one the United Methodist Methodist Church is embarking on. What do we believe about homosexuality and what are we going to do about it? And they're in this heated debate about who is right and who is wrong and what how are we going to handle this? And in the Atlanta area, the battle is heated and it is ugly. And there's two churches, prominent churches in the Atlanta area, and they are head to head on what they believe. And yet in the middle of this battle, the senior pastor of one of the churches, tragedy hits his life. His own son loses his life. He dies because of a mental illness. And he is young and it wrecks their community. And the other church, instead of keeping on with the fight, which is a fight that needs to be had, we have to figure out what we believe. They put the fight down, they put their opposition down, and they say, this person who disagrees with us is a human being and is a child of God. And they poured love and affection, and they surrounded him and his time of need. That's the embodiment of the gospel today. Another story. Last week, the President of the United States put out several executive orders. Did you hear about them? (laughs) It was funny. (laughs) Hours after the final executive order, a mosque in Texas was burned to the ground. Where's the picture? There it is. It was burned to the ground beyond use. It was the result of a hate crime. And the next day, The rabbi at the local synagogue, the Jewish place of worship, went to the imam and said, here are the keys to my synagogue. Please use it. Please use it. And the president of the temple said, everyone knows everybody else. We know several members of the mosque and we have felt for them. When a calamity like this happens, we have to stand together. We're not here to decide which side we agree with. That is not what I'm here to talk about today. It's not even something I want to touch with a 10-foot pole. Trust me. (laughs) What I want to say is neither of these groups, the Jews or the Islams, profess Christ as we do. For centuries they have fought over theology, politics, you name it, they've fought about it. Neither of them profess Christ, yet last week they embodied Christ for us. They didn't necessarily mean to, but they did in a time of darkness. They, li- they laid aside their differences and decided to love each other. This is what Jesus is teaching us about. Jesus' call to love our enemies is not an easy one, but it is a true one, and it is a specific one. And those are broad examples, and we're thinking, well, we don't have a mosque in our community, then I'm not planning on burning it down. So how does this apply to my life? How does this apply to us here in Fernandina Beach? Here's what I think Jesus is saying. We face difficult decisions each day in our lives. And the passages that we've read over the last several weeks and that we'll continue to read for weeks to come are lessons from Jesus that can help us change our mind and affect the way we make decisions. If you are my age and older, You will remember the old phrase, what would Jesus do? Do you remember what I'm talking about? WWJD, right? You wore a bracelet. Who had a bracelet? Am I the only? There are just a few people. I couldn't find mine for today, and I wish that I had had one, one for all the kids. I don't know where this phrase went, but I think it's perfect for today. What would Jesus do is what we should be asking before we do anything, right? The promises that we make, am I likely to keep them? What would Jesus want me to do? Right? When I promise to complete a project at work on time, am I actually doing that? When I promise to my kids that I will take care of them, am I doing that in the best way that I can? When I go online and I post something hateful about the opposite political party, but I call it righteous indignation, am I turning the other cheek? and showing love through non-retaliation. It's not that 
I'm telling you not to stand up for what you believe in. I'm the last person to say that. What Jesus is calling us to do is to be intentional and loving about how we do it. It is our job to love. The last verse of this passage says, in some translations, be therefore perfect as our Father in heaven is perfect. And it's not about making sure you know which fork to use at the dinner table or um, paying all your bills on time. Those would be things that are perfection. No, this is about God says, I love all people. And in my love, there is completeness. And therefore, you are called to do the same thing. It's our job to put aside our differences and to put God's love into action. We at this church, that is our motto. To put God's love into action. And to do as Christ teaches us. For if we don't take up the mantle, you and I, who is going to do it? I'll tell you who's going to do it. The Muslims and the Jews, they're already doing it. And they're not doing it in the name of Christ because they don't profess Christ, but we do. And that love is even more complete and it's more perfect. And if you don't take up the mantle and I don't take up the mantle of Christian perfection, Christian love, who is going to do it? Our world is in need of you. Our world is in need of me. As matter as imperfect as we feel today, Christ is challenging us this morning, and I am thankful for it. So I promise today to look at every person as a child of God. I promise today to put aside what I think about a certain issue and instead seek to see grace and love in another person, to see the, their humanity as God created them. What is your promise today? It will be different than mine. We are different people. But Jesus is speaking to you today. That's why you're here. So we want you to look deep within your souls. We want you to search your spirit and say, where is it that I am not showing the love of God? For if we all do that today, and we affect change in one person, and that person affects change in one person, soon what seemed impossible has already happened. All because of the grace of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. It is so appropriate that on this Sunday where we are called to make promises, where we are challenged to go and be